So this is the third and final of our um, online conversation sessions with Flat Liverpool Framework for Resilience. Um, these sessions have brought together artists, researchers and activists in collaboration with Arts Formation. Um, I'm Kate and I'm the public programme producer of FACT. And for those of you who aren't familiar with FACT, we support um, and exhibit art and film that embraces new technology and explores digital culture. We're based in Liverpool on Wood Street and our building opened in 2003. We have three art galleries, a cinema, a lab for learning, a bakery, a cafe and a bar. Um, if you want to find more about what we do or how to get involved, you can visit our website, which is fact.co.uk. I think a link will appear in the chat. Um, and if you want more information about these events, um, it's fact.co.uk forward slash framework for resilience. And I think there'll be a link for that as well. Come in. Um, just a few digital housekeeping points before we begin. There are um, closed captions available for this talk. Um, if you see at the bottom of your screen, there's a label of subtitle CC. The subtitles are using um, artificial intelligence technology, so they're not super accurate. But if you do want to switch them on, we recommend opening the uh, transcript option, which will appear on the side of your screen. We'd love to hear your questions for our speakers. Um, so you can question, ask a question at any point. If you click the Q&A button, you can type your question and just press submit. Even if it's a, like a general question about a technical issue or something else, um, you can just use that function as well and someone will help you out. Um, we'd love to welcome some tweets throughout the event. So our handle is fact underscore Liverpool and you can use the hashtag FFR2021. Um, so I'll introduce our speakers for the session. Um, the session will be moderated by our head of programme, uh, Maitri Mashwari, and our guests are Ali Medji, Jessica Elmal and Neelu Sharifi. We'll explore themes of migration and adaptation, asking how might digital spaces create alternative definitions of community and identity shaped more by more fluid notions of belonging and how can new technologies allow us to adapt and change to ecological conditions. You can find out more information about all of our speakers on the webpage for this event, which is fact.co.uk forward slash framework for resilience. Um, we are going to have a five minute comfort break halfway through the session um, and we're going to share a video by Neelu and a clip of a sound work by Jessica. Um, so you can submit a question at any time, but we are going to dedicate the second half of the talk specifically to your questions. Um, and yeah, that's it from me. I'll hand over to Maitri. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to be uh, moderating this, uh, the last in our series of online conversations, Framework for Resilience. Um, we wanted this session to consider questions of migration and belonging. Um, I think we're all familiar how in recent years we've become uh, too surrounded by the jingoistic language around migrants and the laying of blame at their feet for the inequalities and austerity imposed on populations across the West by governments who arguably are more interested in rewarding the recklessness of financial institutions than meeting the needs of their citizens. Um, next month, the war in Iraq will be old enough to vote in most countries around the world. And last month, we marked the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring. Um, while we recognize these conflicts as legitimate grounds for human migration, the impacts of other political decisions that affect the environment people live in, which are in turn made as a consequence of shifts in the climate caused by extractivist industries are diminished as purely economic. Um, and a contemporary example of that might be the protests that are going on in Delhi at the moment by uh, individual farmers uh, challenging uh, a new legislation that might uh, diminish their own capacity uh, to maintain their livelihoods. Um, and the capacity to maintain a livelihood is an inherent human need, and people have moved for millennia as a, with the seasons. Uh, the 2020 World Migration Report unequivocally states, the idea that most people do not move or are fixed at a specific location might be appealing, but it is wrong. Uh, mobility is an in inherent characteristic of all populations, unless specific policies or other factors are in place that limit or control that mobility. Um, to bore you with a bit of statistical data, uh, in 2015, there were approximately 242 million people 
living outside their country of birth, um, which by 2018 had increased to 272 million. That's still only 3.5% of the world's population. Um, but what the World Migration Report suggests is the unprecedented pace of change in the geopolitical, social, environmental and technological spheres has led to what one commentator describes as an era of intense turbulence, disillusionment and bewilderment. Uh, the political upheavals and conflicts of the 21st century have prompted ever greater securitization, not just of borders and the movement of people, but of domestic populations as well, facilitated by a revolution in digital technology. And yet at the same time, this technology has allowed increasing numbers of people to access information, goods and services from around the world and encouraged the formation of global communities of interest not bound by the limitations of location. Um, our own specific context in Liverpool, um, which was once the richest city, one of the richest cities in the empire, uh, as a result of being the biggest port of the British Empire, um, has the history of being the oldest settled, having the oldest settled black population and the oldest Chinese populations in the UK. Um, so it's perhaps important to start um, our conversation and discussions today with deconstructing some of these histories of migration and the nationalistic rhetoric that accompany it. Um, so I'm really excited to be talking about all of this with our speakers um, and I'm going to ask them all to introduce uh, themselves uh, first, uh, Ali, Jessica and Nilu, and then uh, we'll, we'll get going. So I'm going to hand over to Ali first. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for virtually welcoming welcoming me to Liverpool. It's a really nice city. I haven't been there for ages, so it's nice to, <laughs> to be in, in Liverpool virtually. Um, so I'm a lecturer in sociology and at the University of Cambridge, and I work on post-colonial theory and critical race theory. So I guess the kinds of um, topics I'm interested in do overlap with migration, do overlap with questions of climate justice and so on. So I'm looking forward to the conversation that we can get going in the next couple of hours. Um, I'm Neelu. Um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. Um, my, I, the main thing I've done, I guess, that is relevant to the discussion today is I curated Arrival City in 2019 for Fact, which was um, um, the, a local response to the Goethe Institute's Arrival City um, exhibition in the Venice Biennial in 2016, which is all about looking at city like modern cities of immigration. Um, but apart from that, my work mostly focuses around trying to find the divine and also human connection through and with technology. Hi, I'm Jessica. Um, I'm based in Manchester and I'm an artist, writer and curator. Um, my work is mainly focused around themes of migration, um, post-colonialism, climate justice, um, but I try to do this um, through very like local projects. So lots of co-production with um, people in the localities and because I think that by looking locally, that's how we can reflect on the um, global issues. Sorry, find the unmute button. Um, <laughs> um, so I guess it's 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 really wonderful to kind of have a range of different experiences and backgrounds in a in a conversation like this. Um, and when we had our sort of preliminary kind of pre-meet uh, a, a week or so ago, one of the there was lots of ideas that kind of got thrown around, and I, I wanted to start with one um, that was something that Ali brought up, uh, which was really this idea that what we see today isn't a sort of recent phenomenon, like people have been moving, as, as I said, for, for millennia, but um, a lot of the, the roots of where we are today in the world come from um, a, a colonial history. And it might, for me, that's a kind of really important past to sort of start to unpick um, because it, it leads to a lot of the other kind of questions that come up um, for, for all of us. Uh, going forward and how we might think of alternatives um, and different approaches to um, the problems that are faced both through uh, by groups of people who migrate to other countries but also um, to how we might rethink our relationship 
to land national identity um, and the kind of rhetoric that goes around it. So I, I wonder if I could ask Ali to talk a little bit um, to begin with, because um, you said something very interesting in our in our in our preliminary chat, and I'm not going to butcher it by sort of trying to paraphrase you. So I'm just going to hand over to you. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think that what's so great about this is that, you know, as a sociologist, I don't tend to see things as being separate processes, but we kind of study how all of these different processes are actually extensions of the same thing. Um, so obviously the way you've set up this conversation in terms of thinking about the climate, but also new technologies and migration simultaneously is a really good example of that. And I think what we were talking about before was how, when we think about the relationship between the climate, the climate crisis and migration and essentially forced migrations, we're talking about a process that started hundreds of years, years ago. Um, in that moment of 1492, where the Americas began to be colonized by the Spanish and Portuguese, because it was in that moment that you essentially get the birth of extractivist capitalism, a capitalism which was based around the principles of we need to extract resources of the earth and turn it into products that can be sold for capital gains. Um, so prior to the colonization of the Americas, it was actually China who were the leaders in the global economy, mostly because they were so rich with silver and gold. But upon the colonization of the Americas, Spain and Portugal came across all of these new territories, all of these new lands um, that were really rich with these minerals and, and resources, extracted them and therefore became key players in the global economy. And that's where you get the birth of um, this relation between colonialism climate destruction because it involved destructing land and extracting properties from the land um, and, uh, and this kind of power relation which we refer to as coloniality. And I think that what's really interesting now is that as we are saying it's not something that just happened in 1492, it's something that still carries on today. So if you want to think about Liverpool, Liverpool is such an interesting case because it was literally the centre of the global political economy throughout the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries because um, it, it was basically the hub of British industrialization, right? So, but if you think about British industrialization, one of the success stories was cotton and the textile industry. But I think 90% or so of the cotton that was imported into Britain came from the labor of the enslaved in the US. So there's this relation between colonialism, enslavement, extractivism, and British industrialization. Um, that cotton was then shipped to, to, uh, to Liverpool, uh, where it was then transported to Manchester, turned into clothes, it was then put, given back to Liverpool and then it was transported across the world. So it clothed people in the Caribbean and it clothed people in India. Now, both the Caribbean and India were actually leading exporters of cotton prior to, to colonialism. So also this British industrialization involved destroying markets abroad, destroying the markets of their colonies. And once again, Liverpool is a focal place in that, right? Um, and then just to finish off, I think that that's the reason why it's really interesting to think about what Stuart Hall says when he describes himself as being the sugar at the bottom of the English cup of tea, because, you know, Stuart Hall is this intellectual that came from Jamaica to the UK. Um, and he's saying there are plenty of others beside me who are the cup of tea itself. And he's saying that this is really the outside history that is inside the history of the English. And he's pointing out that what it means to be British has never been constrained by the literal physical national borders of Britain, but has always been shaped by both temporarily what Britain were doing in the past in colonial expropriation and um, what Britain were therefore doing transnationally, so outside of their national borders in terms of taking stuff from the colonies and importing it back. Um, so I guess just to kick off you know, the conversation, I was thinking about how questions of migration and climate injustice are all kind of sharing in this history of 1492 and the power relations that were born in that particular historical moment. That, um, it's quite a, that's quite a meaty place to start. I mean, I, th I guess it's also that thinking through of how um, when we're thinking about extractivism, um, it's about sort of this idea of breaking things down into uh, components um, whose value is determined by the use to which they can be put. So people as labor, um, soil for the crops it can yield or um, the land for resources like oil or, or, or mineral wealth that can be extracted from it. And one of the things that I think increasingly through uh, the kind of discussions that have emerged over the last few years, but have always been part of a sort of activist community is rethinking ideas around um, this sort of 
extraction into something that feels more holistic. So how do we how do we change this idea of othering um, and dehumanizing or um, or re reducing something um, to uh, in order to be able to extract and exploit from it into something that can uh, yeah uh, be taken to to sort of a more holistic approach and and sort of re-engage with our relationship as humans to the land as part of an ecosystem within an ecosystem rather than as something that sits outside of it. And I know Jess, you've done a lot of work recently with um, uh, working especially with uh, micro communities and, and gardens and gardening and this relationship to the land and how that has changed. It'd be great to hear you talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, so in Manchester and in Cumbria, I've run uh, like projects with local communities um, of migrant backgrounds to sort of explore um, explore the right to nature, the right to green spaces, and also get those benefits of, for example, um, touching the soil, um, growing things from being around nature, which has many benefits um, to people. And through through those projects, we've created artworks, which at the same time, um, hopefully then like reflect on questions to do with climate justice, to do with extraction, to do with um, forced migration. Um, and just to come back to um, what you said before um, about, you know, how do we how do we create a world that's more holistic? Like the people in power, that's not what the people in power um, are aiming for. Like for, for the people in power, this is the structure that works well for them to have people um, who live frictionlessly in the world. We have to have people who are in friction because of the structures that are in place um, so, it, you know, there's people who benefit from the world's resources and to have people that benefit, you have to have people that are exploited because of it. And sometimes I think that when we ask these questions, we um, forget that actually for certain people, this is working. For us, we think, oh, it's not working. We need to change it. But actually, for the people who set this in place, it's working fine for them. This is this is how they want it to work. Um, so I just wanted to, like, address that um, balance. Um, yeah, this, what you're both talking about here makes me want to share this poem that I found when I was um, researching a piece I wrote about um, Liverpool's cyclical history. And I went back to find out like the when Liverpool started, which was I think the year 500 or something. <laughs> and it was seven streets. Um, and like Ali was saying, um, Liverpool was a hub for industrialization, but before that, it was absolutely a barren city. Um, in the year, yeah, in the year 1571, the population was below 600 people, and they had to beg Elizabeth I for a subsidy from a payment, and they signed a letter, Her Majesty's poor, decayed town of Liverpool. And it wasn't until the first shipment of tobacco arrived from Virginia that's in 1648 that Liverpool's fortune turned. So like, it's these colonial projects that are shaping all these questions of identity and um, the often like emotional stories of um, oppression that we find ourselves embroiled within. And I thought that this, sit, this poem written in 1832 by Elizabeth Landon really helps to show what Jess is saying that this is the plan like it's not a deviation from the plan we've not gone awry like this what's happening now has actually always been the, the idea and yeah it goes Liverpool where are they bound those gallant ships that here at anchor lie now quiet as the sleeping birds beneath the summer sky a little while the wind will rise and every ship will be with plashing prow and shining sail afar upon the sea. In peace they go with pure intent, intent and with this noble aim, barbaric hordes to civilize, by traffic to reclaim. They go for knowledge and in hope such knowledge may avail to draw the savage and unknown within the social pale. 
Science, thy own adventurers, again are on their way, and but for thy most glorious hopes, what were our mental day? Sail on, proud bark, a lofty aim it was that freighted thee, and for their sake, who tread thy decks, God speed thee o'er the sea. Um, that was for on the occasion of McGregor Laird's expedition to establish trade routes along, along the Niger Delta, and almost everyone died um, on that journey. And yeah, I thought that poem was like a really good example of what Ali was saying about how all these things are interlinked. Um, science, the idea of science and the progression of it, um, the necessity that creates is to tell a narrative where you've got this dichotomy between the social pale and then the savage unknown when that's just an, you know, that's just a narrative that's being transposed onto a world that was working pretty fine without <laughs> the, yeah, the, the power structures that are now very much in play and like from to, to the personal level in each of our lives, um, yeah. Um, it, it seems like it's um, that the, the 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 two things go hand in hand. That this this idea of um, acquisition of a of, of resource um, it opens up sort of new new places, new uh, new lands, new people, um, which is you know. From a from a human curiosity point of view, an extraordinarily exciting op opportunity to learn, but in so doing, you then start to kind of create these sort of um, these uh, structures of knowledge, and those structures of knowledge then start to create, um, I guess, taxonomies and differences which you can then impose on people to um, to allow you to exploit them, to allow you to extract from them, because. Um, you can classify people in one way or classify people in another and that it is another process of, of othering um, and that the scientific discourse has been co-opted like the, the kind of curiosity and the uh, desire to learn and understand has been co-opted into um, a, a, a tool for, for domination and, and dominating and I guess that there's, there's something I don't know um, it'd be it'd be interesting to kind of think about how how we can kind of what are the other forms of knowledge knowledge production that that maybe don't try and sort of create such sort of definitive distinctions uh, between things. I think that's really interesting because um, you, you know when when you were talking about how encountering difference we we naturally kind of create a hierarchy. That's actually you know not a necessary thing. So if you think about present day United States, we know that travelers from West Africa actually went to the United States, but didn't colonize it, right? They, they returned back. So they didn't engage in that um, classification that we did as British people when we colonized it. And, you know, similarly, if you think about Latin America, loads of Jewish people had to escape Europe, especially around the time of the Spanish Inquisition and, you know, in the 1500s and 1600s, to escape anti-Semitism and they found refuge in Latin America, but they also didn't go down that route of um, translating supposed difference into a hierarchy. And actually you can see these amazing solidarities being formed between indigenous uh, people in Latin America with Jewish um, refugees from Europe and the amazing solidarities that were formed between them. So I think that it's really interesting that you pose that question because it really does point out to us that so much of what's happened in the world has happened on quite contingent factors, right? And it didn't have to be this way and therefore that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and I think that it comes back to what you were saying at the very beginning. One of the things that happened with colonialism is not just, um, uh, as you were saying, an extraction of all of these materials, but also a destruction of various knowledge practices. So if you think about even present day, if you think about the devaluation of, for example, indigenous knowledges, you can think about even today, all of the struggles over land in places like Hawaii, it's really not just about the land itself, but how we even understand what land is for and how you have the kind of Western understanding, as you were saying, which is very much based on this idea that land is useful in as much as it provides capital profits. Whereas if you think about what's going on in Hawaii, land is literally defined as land that feeds. It's seen as a familial elder. It's seen as actually having features of personhood itself um, and it has this nurturing quality and therefore it's not something that you can just 
take resources and profit from, but it's something that you have to engage in a kind of transhuman relationship with. Um, so I think that it's really interesting to also think about how there's an epistemological, there's a kind of knowledge basis and a destruction of knowledge at the heart of all of these things that we're talking about as well. And also a contingency that, you know, it didn't have to be this way. Yeah. Um, just another example of, of that, Ali, is um, quite recently, in like 2010, there was a um, quite a lot of media coverage in France of, the, of a women's movement for land rights um, in rural Morocco. Um, and the language of the, the French news articles is very, um, very kind of on this binary of like, let's save the women from these horrible men. Um, you know, they're not allowed to inherit land. This is wrong. Um, but when I actually looked into it, the land was um, considered communal. So in the past, it was the tribe's land. The farming practices were arable, which means they don't take more than what's going to regenerate. Um, and it was, you know, um, farming for living rather than farming for, for market. Um, and the idea of anyone owning the land actually only came in with the French protectorate. Um, and from then things have spiraled to now um, foreign investors wanting to buy the land to create holiday homes. And so you can't buy land without it going to someone. But from this French protectorate, when they brought in the idea of owning land, um, they put, I think it was like the, tr the tribal chiefs or the tribal leaders down. And so then due to laws, and progressions in Morocco, women have been um, unable to inherit any of that um, money because of, of the laws that are in place. But rather than focusing on the, the fact that not just women, but the men as well were protesting against the selling of this land because it was ancestral communal lands, the French chose to focus on let's save these women. They need to get the money from the land rather than let's not sell the land at all. So it's that um, process that's just continuing and, and um, always... I, I feel like in the West, it's just being masked by these other narratives. Um, yeah, the thing I wanna contribute about that point is like, so I'm gonna tell a small personal story, which was when I was in primary school, there was a boy in my class who used to um run away from me and and say that I have germs right which is obviously like has all these racial whatever and like maybe some people listen to that might be like oh that's so sad but then two years later one day he sat me down and said I'm so sorry um for being horrible to you the reason that I was like that to you is because my brother was in the army and I was having a really tough time and I think similar to what Jess was saying, like the more common narrative that would be brought to the forefront is like, that's so unfair. This white boy was making fun of me because this and that. But if you look at like the material history that led up to that moment, um, the reason I'm in this country is because in 1953, there was a coup of um, in, in Iran where the CIA toppled the democratically elected president of Iran, um, which led to a whole history, which has led to the current mess that Iran is today. Um, and the point of doing it was to extract Iran's oil. Um, so that's, you know, that's what's led to the mess that led to my parents leading, deciding to come to this country to pursue a better life. And it is the same um, rationale of greed that creates a situation where that little boy's older brother felt like he had few options other than to go a pursue a career in the military um and when you when we talk about privilege on an interpersonal level we're often arguing over um incremental levels of differences when when you look at the material conditions that lead to these squabbles there's actually a huge number of people that have a lot in common in terms of being victimized by a very certain demographic. Like you could trace back um, the plight of working class people in this country to the Enclosures Act 
where the land was taken away from the people. So it, it seems like it's the same story repeating over and over again. And the, and the one that's imposed over it is almost this like Jacqueline Wilson-esque, like, oh, I'm so sad because people are mean to me. It's like, I'm an adult now. I would like to not have my politics be based around who hurt my feelings at what at what a particular time. Like that's sort of what I'm trying to bring to conversations like this, even though I'm not particularly an expert on history, but that's, I think what disappoints me most when things happen, like Jess was describing, where there's, there's a material condition being overlaid with all of this emotional rhetoric that distracts from what the real issue is. Yeah, it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's a really difficult one, isn't it? Because to some extent, how do you, when, when so much of this politics is based around um, identity and, and creating these uh, identities for people that uh, set their value uh, in, in, it, within a particular kind of social context, um, how do you remove the identity politics from it? How do you get beyond um, this idea of division? Um, because you know, we're if if you want to kind of allow for, um, it, well, if you want to allow for the fact that these things aren't that, that race or the kind of uh, the racialization of identity is a tool through which um, exploitation can happen, um, then it, it's first having to admit the fact that ex exploitation and extraction is a thing that you're going for and you're using this as a means to an end. And, and actually it's how to, how to do away with certain amount of the, the identity politics because it, it clouds the other thing which is the underlying motivation behind something. Um, and, and, you know, I, I completely agree that sometimes you just get a bit like, I'm done talking about who I am, where I come from. I, like to just get to the point now, please. Um, I don't know as a as a sociologist, Ali, if you've got thoughts on that. Have you encountered similar conversations? Yeah, I, I think I think it's a really good uh, point to have been raised because once again, it points to kind of our interconnected histories, right? And our how identity is never a singular thing, but identity only makes sense in virtue of who you're being compared to, right? Um, so when I teach race, a really interesting exercise that I do with, for example, first years, would have, and it's the first time they come across this idea of the social construction of race, is to say, you know, everyone who has brown eyes, do you want to raise your hands? And you can see that there are some people in a room, including myself, who have brown eyes, and yet we never really kind of classify ourselves as being people who have brown eyes, right? And it comes back to this Bob Marley song, which uh, Paul Gilroy actually writes about really well, and he says that the the aim of anti-racism is to make the color of your skin mean nothing more than the color of your eyes. Um, because what we actually need to do is we need to abolish the concept of race, but you can't abolish the concept of race until you abolish a system of racism. And uh, that's one of the first things that we need to wrap our head around is that there is no concept of race that is not hierarchical, right? Race was constructed in a very specific moment to, as you said, legitimize very particular social relations. Um, it was legitimized first by the church, then it was legitimized by uh, natural science, including evolutionary thinkers like Darwin, who were really keen eugenic race scientists, if you look at his pieces like The Descent of Man. Um, and then it was legitimized by basically, you know, uh, transnational organizations like the IMF and the World Bank with questions to do with self-determination and political civilization. So um, yeah, the first thing that we need to wrap our heads around is that racism gives rise to race. It's not race that necessarily gives rise to racism. Um, and if you envisage it like that, it means that all of the differently racialized people actually share um, a really deep interest in getting rid of that system of racism so that we can get to a stage where the color of my skin means nothing more than the color of, of my eyes. And I think that connected vision is, is um, it has been preached for several centuries, and I think it's really powerful. I mean, it's it's also then connected, I suppose, to the experience of it as you know, uh, 
as someone who's moved, you know, I, my personal history is that I'm a first generation immigrant. Um, but, you know, I've, I've lived here most of my life and it's how do I, you know, to what extent has my process of uh, overcoming that been to adopt uh, the behaviors and the language and the privilege or, and the kind of cultural position of, uh, you know, the people who have that privilege in this country naturally. So the, the kind of majority white population. Um, to what extent have I had to sacrifice my own Indianness in order to do that? Um, you know, and there's this kind of tension between, I suppose, where you come from, uh, where you are, and how you get to be, get to be both. Um, and do, you know, why shouldn't you get to be both? But uh, the the questions around race and privilege sort of determine um, who you are and where you come from, and 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 how you're read by a society. Um, and I, I guess Nilu, that's a lot of what Arrival City was sort of addressing as a, as a project. Um, yeah, when I did Arrival City, um, I was looking at the original exhibition, the, Bi the Venice Biennial exhibition, and that was like a really optimistic manifesto about what makes Arrival City so great. And I guess it was in response to the popular vilification of areas where most of the population are immigrants and it was very like the arrival city is a network of immigrants this arrival city is close to schools it was all about how you know we should look upon these areas as a positive thing for the city and it was very much from the perspective of you know jet these german arrival cities that have maybe been there for like 50 years or so these areas that are like mostly migrants and they wanted us to apply it to the city we were from and with Liverpool I felt like I mean I'm, I think it's the case with all when, whenever you try and think about my, my immigrant as an identity because it isn't an identity it, it just describes like a, something that happens in life where you move from one country to another and I think in Liverpool that's even more so the case because it has this really long history of migration um, and people are here for all types of different reasons. So I guess what I wanted to do there was, okay, if we're gonna talk about um, migrant identity, let's make it very personal and show the complication, the diversity that exists within this so-called category because you know, you've got people who've been here for generations and generations and generations in the black community and the Chinese community who are ultimately now just scousers but don't feel that way because they're continuously being pushed into certain areas or you know not fully accepted within the social fabric and that's one issue and I kind of deferred to other people's expertise on most things um and then you've got, and then I kind of zoomed in on like Iran, it, like uh, like uh, the reason that we I moved here and the method by which my family moved here was through educational privilege. So like in Iran, my parents were both in a position to come here with like university scholarships versus people I know are here because they've had to flee for political reasons or because they just, you know what I mean? Like they couldn't live there anymore. So they had to come here like by very dangerous means. Like it's a totally different experience and it will totally change what your experience of being a migrant is here as well. So I think like, I just really wanted to draw attention to the fact that the category of immigrant is really meaningless unless you take into account people's individual stories. Um, and I think, yeah, like now I'm in a place where I'm starting to try and learn more about what I see as the the more prescient issues. And I think that's what really helps me like escape that, you know, there's like emotive, you know, you asked before, like how do we get away from these feelings that are so strong and about belonging and, you know, that's very, it's like a very primal thing. It's not, it's not that easy to just forget about it. But I think it helps to have like a more zoomed out historical perspective and that just takes time to like learn about things. Um, yeah, like right now I've been looking into the work of, uh, oh, I'm so bad with names, let me, <laughs> what her name is. Um, 
yeah I don't oh god I'm so bad with names I apologize but I've been looking into the work of Shiva what's her name Vandana Shiva who looks at um how companies like that of Bill Gates are continuing the project of companies like Monsanto which are in turn you know continuing the, pro the project of Nazi Germany so I think having a zoomed out perspective really helps with escaping um these like very emotive personal perspectives and then zooming in really far helps you to understand that no two people are really the same if you get deep into it like me being Iranian is just one aspect of me me being Scouse is just one aspect of me and then everything else that I'm interested in and you know being a citizen of the internet and all those things like there's no there's no meaningful way to talk about groups of identity unless like what Ali said would would do in comparisons and would and would do it we're talking about these like system systematic experiences that will be common between people but don't actually tell you about the person in itself yeah it's 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 also kind of that um that there's that sort of shift also when you when you talk about um you know being having all of these multiple facets to your identity um and what that means in terms of that sense of belonging um, I remember in, when we spoke last week, both you and Jess had uh, really interesting sort of stories about your, your families and like how, I suppose, the communities that uh, different generations build around them um, through that process is very, is very different. You know, so your sort of sense of community and who, who your people are, are, are different to that of your parents. And I think there's a, there's a sort of generational shift in terms of, how how I suppose people who who've moved moved country for various reasons how they adapt and how they build uh, their sense of home and what what that home constitutes and whether home is constituted by uh, the community that you build around it around yourself or home is designated by something else where um, I think for some people traditionally there is this kind of connection to land and nation and uh, and whether those kind of old old fashioned ideas of um patria um are, are are still relevant anymore and you know do is is there a kind of mother country still or are we you know should we consider ourselves something different I think I really struggle with with that question because the very like idea of a nation is excluding some people and including others. Um, but then, especially in my work, because I work a lot with people and people of, of different identities, but I, I really value interconnectivity and shared histories and shared experiences and shared knowledges. And I think, so yeah, I, I really struggle because for example, um, you know, if, like you meet someone who is of maybe like of the same geographical lineage of lineage as you as someone who's like a second generation immigrant it might be like oh cool we both eat couscous on a Friday or or whatnot but then I whether that's then tying into this idea of national identity which I am also opposing is really difficult because at the same time that does bring comfort and it does bring a sense of self um so I guess for me it's um I try to think of it as like outside of that realm of like the nation as a, a power structure and more within the interrelations between people if that makes sense yeah it's definitely like a bewildering time to be alive because I mean, we're constantly exposed to all these other perspectives, like maybe, you know, even 20, 30 years ago, like our experience would be a lot more tied to like where you live. Whereas now it's like, about like where, what part of the internet you spend time on and like all of this, all this other stuff. Um, it is, it is really hard to get a grasp of 
what ha having a culture can mean and the value that still that still is actually yeah within that um personally like I'm not a fan of this like trend of diaspora uh romanticizing the homeland because I think it's almost like infantilizing sometimes like that whole I mean I'm not going to name names but you know those you know those poems that are like my my home is jasmine and flowers like you know whatever <laughs> like <laughs> like that I mean it's fine and everything but I just think it it overwrites a lot of like the actual realities that we're living in and but at the same time I, I do think that culture and community is like the bomb for all of these um inflammatory topics and yeah the, all the friction that we find ourselves living in I just I don't know because it's there's a there's a really difficult contradiction with it because like the computers that we use the phones that we use it's all contributing to this this um or like it's all a result of the extractivist history of science or like modern technology like even the, the devices that we're using to have this conversation today like I'm using a Mac like it's hard to yeah it's hard to unmake the soup really but I do think that we have a unique opportunity to go beyond um location-based notions of identity um or at least yeah ident or like identity-based forms of community going beyond that because you know what the world I would really like to live in is one where everything a robot makes is free um and we all have access to freshly grown local food and we don't have to worry about shelter and those communities do not have to be look a certain way like in my personal life like I probably have like an equal amount of white friends versus non-white friends versus gay friends versus straight friends like I when it comes to an interpersonal thing like I, do, I can't really put into words what it is that makes me connect with another person and I think like the internet and this digital age like gives you a unique opportunity to like escape from like the con the constraints of your locality but I don't know really because maybe the answer is that we all have to turn off our computers forever do you know what I mean like it's so <laughs> I don't I don't really have like a good answer or a neat answer I think it's like a, it's definitely like a bewildering time to be alive but like we have an opportunity to lean into the bewilderment at least and see where that goes I, th I think it's also really interesting to think about how, you know, once again, the, the, the possibilities of how we can categorize ourselves are quite often not uh, to do with our control, right? Um, and once again, how they're super contingent and constructed. So like, even if you're thinking about national identity, well, for like several centuries, to be British meant this really global thing, right? You could be British if you lived in, in India, you could be British. Like my parents, for example, came to Britain as British subjects, even though they had never been born in Britain, right? They were born in, in Kenya, but they were still British subjects. So it's kind of like the subjects of categorization are always, you know, super open, um, but at the same time, super constraining because as, as um, everyone's been saying, they've been dictated by stuff that's well outside of our own um, control and practice. And they're quite often dictated to us for very specific reasons. Because if you think about you know, these institutions like the National Health Service being set up in the, in the 40s and 50s. Um, it said it was national, but you could you could use it if you were a, a post-colonial citizen, right? But then those post-colonial citizens also weren't called citizens, they were called migrants because migrant allowed them to be stigmatized, even though they were literally citizens of the state. And there were all of these successive acts which tried to turn them from being citizens into migrants, which has now succeeded really well, right? All of us here would be would now be seen as first or second or third generation migrants wouldn't be seen as citizens, um, yeah, not knowing about how all of our parents or ourselves came here. Um, so, so I think it's also really interesting to think about, sometimes the question isn't how do we identify ourselves, but how we're positioned, how we're categorized 
by others, namely via power relations and how that ends up reproducing these inequalities that we've all been speaking about. Yeah, it, it sort of brings up that idea when you when you talk about that that shift that different differentiation between the citizen and the migrant and what what is welcome and what's not welcome and the kind of histories of uh, I guess it was never formally called segregation in the UK but you know no blacks no dogs no Irish it's like uh, it, it's it's all part of the kind of the rhetoric and the language that we've kind of consumed over however many decades and and yet you know things that are welcome you know language culture food I mean god could you imagine British cuisine without the influence you know it's a, such a well-worn cliche that if you didn't have like the spices that were brought to it like by other people um you know that this idea of what is an invasive species people are invasive species but plants uh, clothing, music, none of that is invasive. That's like, bring it on, let's assimilate, let's make all of that part of our own. Um, and, and this sense that we, we devalue life, but, we, but because we can sort of recoup or extract from the things that life produces, you know, culture, food, uh, somehow all of that is welcome. And I, I know that it's, it's kind of, for me, that there's a really interesting kind of tension there between you know, I think it, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of discussion around cultural appropriation. There's been a lot of conversation around, um, of, of, you know, respecting, I suppose, the origins of something. Um, and that in a, itself is, for me, that's really deeply problematic because all culture is hybrid. Uh, it's, all, it, it's developed through movement. It's developed through the movement of people from place to place, drawing on ideas and, and you know, so actually nothing is particularly located. Culture is not located to a place either, just like people aren't located to a place. Um, but I know, Neelu, you do a lot of work with mu music and musicians and that, that sort of hybridity is kind of almost integral to, to, to that way of working. And, and I know, Jess, in the work that you were doing, you've been doing with plants, you I remember you had a really hilarious story about seaweed. Um, and, and how, what kinds of species are welcome and how things travel and it'd just be great to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so um, I did a project um, at MAMA in Rotterdam um, where I was researching into the Strait of Gibraltar, which is the sea in between Spain and, and Morocco, which is the only um, border, the only, it's got the only land border between um, your, the EU and Africa um, because the border doesn't actually stop at the land and it's all interlinked um and yeah so this border is um the last time I researched it it was the second most surveilled border in the world second only to Israel Palestine um but it's not actually um surveillance in terms of like men on the ground which if you like do a quick google image search you get a lot of like border control bulky people in uniform but that's not actually the case it's the most highly surveilled in terms of drones in terms of technological footage in terms of heat maps in terms of I think it is been has been banned now but they did put like a heat map submarine in the sea to kind of monitor whether migrant boats were crossing or not but I think that has been deemed illegal um so yeah we've got this very highly surveilled um border um and actually, quite recently, um, lots of Spanish uh, news articles have been like outraged because foreign algae washes up on South Spain beaches, ruins tourism, people, you know, the Brits can't sunbathe in peace. Um, and it's just really, it's, it's very ironic that this genderless, um, see-through, organism has sort of infiltrated this water which is so highly 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 watched and actually when you look into the history of it they um they, there are traces of them there are theories that this um algae was brought through a trade deal that Spain did with Korea and it was in the ballast of the ships so actually it's something which you know has come through these like trade and migration ag agreements so it's something that was actually you know signed for by the Spanish government but now because it's ruining the tourism and the beaches it's like oh foreign 
algae um and yeah I just thought it was a very it's a very I it's it showcases that whole like scientific language of um exclusion but it's also highly ironic um that it was able to get there undetected um this reminds me of when I was researching that piece I read earlier I learned that what we currently call scientific journal uh, scientific racism used to be called medical journalism it's like <laughs> and these things just shift instead of really um changing and yeah what you were saying Matre, about the hybridity of music it's like species and nature has always been in a constant state of flux and exchange and travel and destruction and creation and it's really like the narratives of it reminds me of something that my therapist told me that was very useful I mean it was about interpersonal problems but I think it applies here as well um it's the trans it's, a, it's an idea in transactional analysis about the drama cycle which is this really it's it's a it's a cycle with three positions in it which is persecutor, victim, and savior. And it's something that, you know, problematic individuals will draw you into. And the reason it's so difficult to escape is because those positions are very attractive to a certain immaturity that exists in every one of us, like the childish part of us that wants to win or lose or be accepted or you know what I mean and I think that this is also the problem that I have with um what I mentioned before with you know the diaspora trend of really romanticizing an, 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 an identity that is lost to you to a large extent and that you know what I mean like if I if I started being like Iran is like jasmine flowers like people in Iran are just like you know what I mean like it, Iran is my life like it's it's got the same complexity as every one of our lives and I think the the narratives that are being imposed on us which are um to do with calling us foreign we don't need to then absorb that and call ourselves foreign do you know what I mean like I, that's the problem I have with it it's like you know my life was much worse what in that in a short period of few years where I first started to clock like racial structures and how they impacted me my, my life was much worse when I considered myself in opposition to people who like were really my mates but didn't share my exact perspective on everything and my life got a lot better when I shifted my perspective a little bit not to overwrite the fact that these social structures have impacted our interpersonal relationships but just to not then come and use the same logic of the state and of wealth to analyze my own fluid you know exchange like full of exchange like full of learning from each other though like that's what an interpersonal relationship really looks like in reality but if you impose these categories on it it's just going to be for, like I'm the foreign algae or like they're the you know what I mean like it's not it's not useful and what you mentioned about the spices as well reminded me of um something I read about how the upper classes in England used to when spice was spices were very a very rare commodity would over spice all of their food and when it became um a, you know a a cheap commodity that the lower classes could have access to and everyone was spicing their food. That's where like British, French cuisine, all of that stuff came in where it's about, it's not about spicing the food to cover up the flavor. It's about getting the best ingredients and making it taste more like itself. It's, you know, wealth is always, the categories of wealth are always predicated on I'm not like other people. And in, and in, and in looking at ourselves, through that lens, we propagate that same rationale, which we don't, it's not, it's not the best way to live. Um, I, I feel like we could go on, but I'm, I'm also conscious of the signs. I'm gonna say, we, 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 we promised a little comfort break. Um, and so I'm gonna use this time to say, we're gonna show a little video by Nidu and the short extracts of the work by Jess. 
Um, Kate's going to just do a little bit of housekeeping about uh, the break. And then Neelu, if you want to say something, do you want to say something now about the video that we're going to watch or we can do it all afterwards? Um, yeah, I'll just quickly introduce it. It's nothing that crazy. It's just, um, it's just a little video I made because I was meant to go to Iran at the start of last year for like three months and I didn't go because I freaked out because of the whole Trump uh, threatening to, you know, me and it was getting a bit touchy and it was like, is there going to be war? So I didn't go. And then, yeah, and then coronavirus broke out and I was basically just really sad and I really missed the run. So I made, I, I went there on Google Maps and went to all the places I was going to visit and I wrote this poem about it and that's what it is. <laughs> Thanks, Nilo. Um, So we're going to take a five minute break um, and we'll see the video by Nilo and um, listen to part of a sound piece by Jessica. Um, they are both available um, to watch as part of the reading list, which is on our website. Um, and then we'll come back after five minutes and we'll start with questions. So if anyone has any questions that they want to um, be answered, you can post them throughout the second half of the conversation or you can send them in the chat, in the Q&A box um, in the break but we'll come back after five minutes. I'm just gonna ask the panelists to turn their videos off so the video goes full screen.
Hello, good morning everyone. I am in the forest and it's the first time that I explore this area and I heard the river that's down on the bottom of the hill and I'm still keep going pro for the yellow oh sorry to the yellow line or yellow way. Now I'm reading digital digital forest. And I have a beard. It's so quiet right now. And I really enjoy it. It's so good. forest. I don't hear the sound of the telly playing in the background or the sound of cars. Or any news. I only hear the sound of the nature being alive, which makes me feel alive. I hear the sound of the birds the tree leaves under my footsteps and the sound of the streams of water. How does the forest make you feel? That's absolutely wonderful. I think I, I, I feel the same, I feel calm and also energized, sometimes a bit overwhelmed. We've had a, we've had a couple of questions in already. Um, I'm going to start with the first one that we got in, which was, um, uh, talking about uh, well it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of uh, internet uh, and digital culture and, and the question is do you think geography matters in the shaping of identity or do you think the digital has de destroyed this notion um, I don't know if anyone wants us to pick that up um, I think I there is a reference and I'll try and dig it out to add it to the reading list. Um, but it's it was a, a idea that like the digital world and the real world are not separate. Like it's like this distinction that people make between the mind and the body. Like the online world is also the real world. Um, and so I guess I just want to make that distinction whenever we talk about things like does the digital render location like nil, like 
we need to think about like there are still locations digitally you know you check into Facebook there are forums and you know like even if it's not a geographical location there are still locations on the internet and I just yeah not necessarily like I have a full answer but I just I always like to come back to that like we are in the digital world therefore the digital world is the same as the world world yeah my quick contribution to that would be no it hasn't because um being scouts is probably more relevant to me than like anything else really like being living in Liverpool and like Jess was saying like you know most of the people I've got on Instagram or Facebook are from Liverpool um I just think that the digital gives you um an access to perspectives that aren't your own like any like for me like a YouTube comment section is a place where you can experience the sublime polyphony of all these different individualities next to each other so um no it just it just it can just expand what you see as your own identity you don't it doesn't have to just be fixed to how your location um responds to you yeah, I'm exactly the same. I think it opens up so many more possibilities, right? So yesterday I was doing a lecture on a um, Haitian revolution and loads of students pointed out that they never learned about it in school, but they learned about it through playing the video game Assassin's Creed Black Flag. And it was kind of like um, showing how different forms of media can actually open up cultural conversations more so than even <laughs> national curricula, which is maybe another topic for discussion, but nonetheless. <laughs> No, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting when you think about the capacity of digital technology to sort of imagine uh, alternate worlds, that the kind of the process of world building that we can do through um, digital technology, through, you know, VR, through the internet, um, that, you know, so much of uh, the world that we, you know, we live in today technologically was invented through the imaginations of science, science fiction writers in the 50s and 60s. And actually, if we were to then sort of think through what future worlds might, might be, you know, we talk about um, this, you know, what Nila, you sort of mentioned, well, in your ideal world would look this way, that people would ha sort of have certain uh, access to things and wouldn't be judged on certain things. And if you can kind of create and envision that world through technology, then I wonder whether actually eventually it helps us to build that world because you can start to, to imagine it. Um, but it doesn't do away with where we are right now. Yeah, and I think another thing to, to think of is, um, so like, yeah, science fiction writers are futurist thinkers, you know, this is like, this is something from an, a novel, what we're living now. But I think what, and it's, you know, it seems very imaginative and forward thinking, but what we have to remember is who did actually make the real life version and the location and structures of power play within that. So like, for example, like, it's very difficult to say anything about Palestine on Instagram because you'll get shut down. It's, you know, there's things like a man's nipple is okay, but a woman's nipple isn't. So, you know, even though, the internet or the digital or technology is this, it opens possibilities. We have to remember like it is still being made with the these structures in place mm -hmm. at the minute anyway. Yeah, and, and, and I guess, you know, the thing with AI is that it's trained, you know, it's trained on us and it's trained on all of the biases and all the prejudices that we bring into the world. So, it's it, it's not neutral technology is definitely not neutral um one of the other questions that's come in um there was a lot of mention about defining the migrant's identity without losing the identity of the individuals uh, can language attrition be considered a linking point at least when thinking about first generation migrants i don't know how to begin with that so i'm going to hand it over to ali <laughs> uh, I was still thinking about it. I guess, um, I guess language does play a key point, right? Um, uh, for loads of different diasporic communities. But I guess the point that I was trying to think about was more so of why we 
feel like we even really need to talk about identity in the first place and like which identities are available to us at particular times, right? Um, and the failure of categorizations to really capture, you know, those moments of individual reflexivity. So I'm visually an Indian British person, right? Visually, and that's how some people would categorize me. But I think that the fact that my parents are also, you know, of the tradition of Shia Islam has really um, important connotations for how they were, how my family were treated when they were in India with Hindu nationalism and formerly before that with the British Empire, right? Um, and so, so I, I mean, just to use that as an example, that's a really good way of thinking about how the, the question should be focused more so on why are we forced into particular identities and how might that um, reproduce not just individual level inequalities, but big structural inequalities uh, to do with questions of migration and refugees and bordering, like we were talking about at the very beginning, rather than kind of focusing on these quite um, micro questions of, oh, you know, how do we get this person to feel a bit more comfortable living in this particular geographical space? Sometimes when we ask those questions, we can kind of, which I do think are really important, but we can kind of get distracted from the much bigger issues, which I think is what um, Nilu and Jessica were both saying as well. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast the other um, day on racial capitalism and the speaker of the podcast said, focusing on like individual people's ignorances is just a distraction from the larger um, questions at play, which I, I, I do, I agree with and I'm trying to bear that in mind in my everyday life, but it's easier said than done. <laughs> but no, I, I do agree with that. It is definitely easier said than done. Um, language attrition though I, I still don't think that that you can really build communities around that like well what you don't have like or what I don't know and I think it just still varies loads like and it and it all can be explained in terms of the history of it again so like I speak Farsi really well um, and like I read it as well and that's partially because I lived there for a couple of years but it's also because um, my parents that was really important to them. I don't have any siblings. So like that was the only language I spoke at home. Whereas I know other Iranian kids in the community who like, they either don't speak Farsi or like they speak it badly. Like it's it just, it, there's so many factors at play. Like it, and it often comes down to like whether their parents were the type to value Iranian culture or whether they were the type to be really like, um, you know, like to diminish Iranian culture in favor of Western culture and see that as like more of like um, an ideal destination to like make sure their children integrate with, you know what I mean? Like it, and that's to do with, again, like the fractures that are within Iranian like politics where some people um, are like anti, Iran, like anti-Iranian culture, they see it as backwards. They kind of come to, they've come to a, a view of it that is in line with, um, you know, popular narratives of what the Middle East is like. And there's other people who know, like, you know, they've moved here because of certain like realities, but they also still ho see a lot of value in like the poetry and, you know what I mean? Like, it's just so individual. Like, I don't think, I actually just don't feel the need. I think as well, like when we're talking about individuality, like one thing I want to say is like, it's not about the individuality is super important. It's actually not. It's just that everyone is very individual and that's not a barrier to us having togetherness. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, we don't need to, organize ourselves around these like shared experiences of pain like we can just hold space for each other's differences and allow that to flourish and that's actually a much better route to having community because then you're not excluded by virtue of like privilege which I think is like a great concept to talk about systematic realities but a terrible concept when it comes to like you know trying to be together with people because then it's like oh like but your parents you know had this advantage over my parents and that means that you know we're different and the it's like oh, you know what I mean <laughs> like ultimately there's very few people who are making these decisions for us that are making us even talk about these things like yeah they're relevant and yeah it, it hurts but how can we move faster I think I think the answer lies in like 
build in personal self-esteem to be honest so that you're not as sensitive basically like it's, it comes down to like individual spiritual growth it it's also kind of crazy right that um you get because i guess the whole point of racialization what is to get rid of the notion of the individual right so the boys said back i think it was in the 40s or 50s to be black means to ride jim crow in georgia like it doesn't matter what you think you are or what you're like as an individual if you're racialized in a particular way there's certain things that you have to do in virtue of society's arrangements right so if i think about it you know even with myself it doesn't matter whether or not i can speak hindi or whether i can speak kachi or whether i can speak you know arabic or whatever if I forget to shave and I go on the underground in London, people look at me funny if I've got a backpack, right? So it doesn't really matter sometimes because that's the whole point of, of racialization. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's it, the, the, there's that system that's imposed on you. And I suppose it's also a product of the kind of colonial legacy that um, what is valued and how your own identity is colonized by, by that system. So, um, you know, uh, of my relatives growing up in India, um, my mum insisted, even though I didn't live there, that I should learn Hindi. Um, and whereas most of my cousins, they all speak Hindi, but they all were just like, we never talked in anything other than English. Even though I was like, but this is my chance to practice. Why won't you talk to me? But it was for them. It was more important. It was more important to speak English than it was to to, to speak their own language. Um, and and I think that, that there's that process in which um, we do adopt. And how do you reject? How do you how do you let go of the expectation that you have to conform to a certain way of being? Um, because um, if you don't conform to that certain way of being, the prejudices that are against you will become even stronger. Um, you know, the, the, there is a sense of self-preservation to some extent that you you allow these things to, um, yeah, you allow these things to happen, but um, but not necessarily by choice. Yeah, I think I think there's a um, I there's like an ideal or like a theory which we can all you know adhere to of how we want to be in the world or how we want the world like um like as an example um queer theory might say well marriage is a patriarchal system we're not concerned with marriage like that's patriarchal in itself our ideal is separate to that and that's really valued and really um you know it, it's a great uh, concept but then you have to look at the material and the real world and actually well when visas are tied to marriage status when things like housing or benefits or whatever is tied to marriage status actually legalizing um gay marriages is the thing that that we need so that is like a almost like it's an assimilation into heteronormativity which as a queer theorist you'd be like no that's not what we're about but then you have to look at the real world and the real material consequences so things like assimilation in language assimilation into culture like while we can theorize that that's not how we want it then you have to look at the material like needs of people and how to live in this world everyone's always had to dance around the the structures of power to still make that change incrementally I think like uh, it's like totally irrelevant to today's discussion but like in uni uh, we did like Ed Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen which was commissioned by Queen Elizabeth I and then he's like worked all these criticisms of Elizabeth I within it and like you know Shakespeare did similar things it's like You've, it, it is frustrating like you know what I mean like I'm speaking English right now <laughs> I'm speaking in a Scouse accent that I had to adopt and get good at so that people would find me funny and accept me like all that boring stuff um but it is what it is like it, it's the tools we've got like we're using computers like these chips would join me and probably like cost lives somewhere along the line so I, I just it reminds me of that meme where it's like you, you criticize society, yet you participate in a contradiction much. And it's like, what do you want me to do? Like dig a hole and lie in it. Like I'm alive, I can't really do nothing else. Like I don't really think me having like becoming a hermit is gonna help anything anyway. So 
it I think it's a case of yeah just like using the the tools that you've got and also identifying those tools as part of power structures but also just getting on with it to an extent because what you know what I mean you're just going to talk yourself into like actual circles as I'm starting to do, starting to do now <laughs> And without wanting to put you on the spot, Ali, I mean, you've, you've written a whole book about this, or several. Uh, yeah, I guess I did write a book kind of about um, strategies of assimilation, thinking about uh, the black middle class in Britain. But but I guess that um, that, were, I, that was kind of prior to my interest in post-colonialism. So I don't have too much to say about it, to be honest. But I think that the, the really important thing is just what Millie was saying just now, is that you're dancing around power structures, right? So lots of this isn't really down to the individual. It's about kind of like almost strategies for survival, learning to speak in particular ways, learning to act in particular ways, learning to talk about particular things that you're not really interested in, but you kind of have to talk about them if you want to fit in. Um, and it raises these questions, you know, Sarah Ahmed does some great writing about this, um, who also bridges queer theory, like what Jessica was talking about, um, where it's very much like, even as soon as you start talking about questions of fitting in, you can't talk about that without talking about power, right? Because you only need to fit in because there's a version of what does fit to begin with. Um, and then you get all of these notions of space invaders and how, you know, people are moving in spaces where they're not seen to be welcome or not seen to belong in. Um, and you can't really have those conversations without talking about stuff like race and class and gender and sexuality and ability and so on. Um, and you can just do it as an exercise, actually, just especially with ability and questions about, you know, disability studies. So many institutions which we take for granted if you, if you are able-bodied like myself are almost impossible to navigate if you don't have a certain level of ability, right? So like the university, for instance, where you might have a lecture um, two till three at one place in the campus and then a lecture three till four on the other side and someone else can kind of get over there in five minutes if you can cycle but if you can't cycle <laughs> you know the university is not an accessible space so um I guess yeah I'm just agreeing with what Nilu was saying in terms of with dancing around power structures quite often but what can you do about it you've got to do what you've got to do right yeah um which I suppose the one of the other questions that's come in um is about um how do you hold on to the importance of rituals with constant hybridization. Um, so if we are in this position of da constantly dancing around um, and, and hybridizing ourselves to be something that fits, how do we hold on to um, those other things? Um, and I don't know if I, we, anyone has personal strategies for, for achieving that, let alone more universal ones. And that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? So, personally, I've really capitulated to mysticism in, when it comes to that because, like, the bewilderment of my early experiences stripped me from any feeling of faith in any, like, uh, organised doctrine, like, you know what I mean? Like, I moved from England where there was Santa to a country where unceremoniously there was no Santa and also a different god <laughs> and like um you know a different costume that you wear to make god like you and all that and then I felt I just felt faithless but actually I don't feel faithless anymore and like this is a very personal thing to be fair don't, not I won't go into it too much but basically I think like you can establish a connection with your creator and choose you know what I mean use what works try different things and use what works like have rituals set up rituals that are your own create rituals within small social spaces like that would be like my strategy like meditate together like whatever it is that works like find some form of ritual because we need it but just you know just because hybridity is bewildering doesn't mean that you can't then pick something specific that like you don't have to be lost in it like that's been my own personal journey it's like you don't have to just be like well why anything because it's all so arbitrary it's like well yeah but you can also just pick something that feels right to you like it's not you know it's fine you're allowed that <laughs> mm, also I just I guess everyone's got a different definition of of what ritual is but but for me I guess if if I'm thinking of like hybridization in terms of migration, like 
the ritual of tea is like a very strong ritual in China, which is now replicated across the world. Um, even things like, you know, the Christmas tree was a pagan ritual. You know, so so rituals move with people and they're adapted and they're took they're adopted and so in that respect um i guess maybe on more of a societal level than an individual level it's not really something that i've um worried about personally um yeah i mean I also at a societal level because uh nidu's been talking a lot about iran there's this iranian thinker i'm really interested in called uh, ali shariati um, and he, for me, is so important because he basically comes at this moment um, where he's saying, like, on the one hand, you have these westernized Iranian elites who are trying to westernize the whole of society and enter in U.S. investment and European investment into the oil industry, which gave rise to exactly what Nili was talking about. Um, and then on the other hand, you had a group of religious fanatics who were only defined in terms of their complete opposition to that westernized elite. And Shariati kind of enters in the middle as this um, Shia Islamic theologian turned sociologist kind of thing. Um, and his approach to ritual is super interesting because he's always saying you have to be historically grounded in the principles of Shia Islam, which itself was actually, you know, meant to be a religion of salvation. Um, and you have to be constantly historically grounded in that without falling into a fanaticism. So you also have to be thinking about how can we apply these and the rituals associated with these to our contemporary situation, which is well, so what Jessica was saying comes in because um, rituals don't have to be dogmatic dogmatism, right? Rituals can be something that we think about very reflexively. And the reason why I brought up Shariati was because what he's saying about Shia Islam is really similar to what people like Gutierrez are saying about liberation theology and Catholicism in the context of Latin America and struggle for social class justice in Latin America and justice against Western intervention. Um, and even then you have exactly the same thing. We want to use the rituals of Catholicism and the really historic practices of Catholicism to think about for example, the IMF and the World Bank telling us how to run our economies in the 1970s. So um, I think that in a sense, hybridization is something that allows for rituals to actually have any sense. Otherwise, you know, um, we'd be talking about stuff that was made in zero BC or, you know, whatever, 10 AD in a completely different society. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't really make too much sense to do that. Um, I was just gonna, when Nilu, uh, when Jess mentioned tea, it was like, there was a really facetious point, but can anyone explain to me what the connection between Yorkshire and tea is? Like Tetley's the biggest tea producer in this country. Why, I, and, and Yorkshire, Yorkshire tea, I just don't understand what the connection between Yorkshire and tea is. Um, but anyway, that was just a really facetious point. If anyone has an answer to that question and wants to put it in the chat, that'd be really helpful. Um, <laughs> but, um, one of the other questions, which actually follows on really nicely from Ali, um, is uh, the, what you were just saying about time and thinking about this historically. And um, is uh, is it ultimately only time that can enable people to come to terms with national identities formed so deeply um, within colonialism? Uh, just uh, just as asking institutions to deal with institutional racism. The depths of ignorance can only be reached over the very long term. Um, and, and I guess I'm always really wary of, of the revolutionary moment where you go from like something to complete shift overnight. And I don't think revolutions historically work, um, but it would be nice to just be over and done with all of this stuff. I'd like to stop talking about it soon. Um, but, um, but, you know, it would, it would also, I wonder whether time is the only cure for all of this. Or if we give it too much time, we just keep falling back into bad practice. We're both muted and then unmuted. Um, I guess my initial response is like, in especially in terms of what these structures are doing to the to the world like we just we don't have that much time like the the climate crisis is happening now and so I guess I'm not really answering the question because I'm not answering is time going to help or will it not or is it the only help I'm just kind of exasperated as like there isn't any time left I guess yeah I was going to say something really similar so it's kind of like um 
yeah, that, that there's one of my colleagues called Gaminda Bambra who works at Sussex. I don't want to pass off what she said as my own. She she said, you know, this is a power structure that began in 1492. You can't expect it. Something that took centuries to develop, you can't expect it to just disappear overnight. Um, so there is that kind of element of something that took a long time to be built will probably also take a long time to be deconstructed. Um, but especially because it's buried into basically every single social structure. But that's that's the second point is what Jessica was saying. If you think about things like um, global capitalism and its relation to coloniality as that kind of colonial relations of power that survived the demise of colonial administrations, they have the power to absorb so much um, into its logic. So I'm thinking about how we, we see, for example, the Haitian revolution as this moment in the early 1800s where, oh my God, you have the first successful slave revolt in colonial history. Um, and we kind of idolize it as this moment, but even after then, it was it was attempted to be colonized by the British, again by the French, um, again by the French, and the Spanish wanted to get involved. Then eventually the US actually did claim it as an imperial territory. So the colonial power structure has an ability to really subsume loads of stuff. The climate crisis is a perfect example of this, because if you look at the dominant ways, especially in the West, that we talk about tackling the climate crisis, they all end up reinscribing that same logic of coloniality. They involve, for instance, switching to vegan diets, which exploit, I don't know, Indian women picking cashew nuts for less than minimum wage on 20 hour working days, or they involve switching to electric cars, the materials of which rely on child labor in Central Africa. Or so, you know, um, they involve in carbon offsetting, which destroys indigenous territories in the, in the Amazon or whatever. So um, the climate crisis is kind of like just such a perfect example to think about how we need so much more than time because um, the way our world is set up, it basically absorbs all of the things that you would think would be contradictory to that very system that's working. Um, yeah, and I think it's a, it's a contradiction that we need to deal with. Um, the only solution I can think of to any of this stuff it's actually something that all of us have the power to potentially do. I mean, it's so hard. I'm not saying I have the power right now to do this, but it's like a power of total refusal because they've got us by the emotions, do you know what I mean? They've got us by the worry and the anxiety and the need to achieve and succeed. Like there's this quote I really like about Caesar, which Plutarch wrote, which was that, after he conquered Pompeii, he sat there crying on his bed, reading about everything Alexander the Great did at a younger age. Um, and he, and it says something like, Caesar's great achievements did nothing to divert his enterprise um, to the enjoyments of that which he had labored for, but rather bred in him designs for new glory as though he had used up what he already had. And it was nothing but an emulation of himself as though he had been another man, something like that. And, um, I think like that's such a good example of like this feeling that we all have individually of like, I need to do something with my life. I need to be someone like, I need to have things. I need to be involved. Like that's what they've got us by the neck with Jeremy. And like, that's why I say yes to jobs. I don't want to do. That's why I um, scroll on, on my phone when like I know that the world will be a better place if I stopped and like I will be happier like it's so hard maybe certain things are just supposed to run its course like Genghis Khan do you know what I mean like certain things are just supposed to ravage the world and then disappear like I don't know but it feels like if if we were going to stop it today we could if we all had the spiritual capacity to simply refuse to just say do you know what that thing that you're offering me, I don't want it. And there's nothing that you can do to make me want it. So what power do you have over me anymore? Like, and I think that actually is like, comes from like inner work and like targeting the seed of worry that is sown in each of us with this reasoning of like, I need to participate. I need to be someone like, I don't, I'm not saying that I have that strength. I actually just don't, I, I'll admit to it freely, but that would be what it would take really like for, for everything to stop it would be like not only am I not going to eat cashew nuts but also I'm not going to eat anything today because we're not going to buy anything today globally and 
I'm going to fast today so that my neighbor who can't fast can have my food. That, do you know what I mean? It would take stuff like on that level of strength. It's, it's quite, um, I mean, that sort of strategy of, of refusal is such a, it's such a powerful one. And like, you know, not just in terms of saying no to the things that you're being sold, but saying, you know, uh, like the refusal of labor, you know, so the idea of going on strike and, and what the power that that has held typically in the, in the 20th century. And yet, you know, the, the, the forces, the power structures have um, systematically dismantled unions, systematically taken the teeth out of the capacity of people to organize themselves and taken the capacity out of uh, people to um, fight, you know, to refuse uh, the conditions that are imposed on them. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, that that model of operation is relevant today, but I, I wonder whether um, the, we, you know, if we have to accept the fact that we are living in this era where even if I don't have the personal strength to say no to this, um, I can use it for something else. I can use it to collectively organize, to kind of, um, to build those other sorts of communities. And I think so much of what we've seen particularly happen in the last year has been because, A, we've all been stuck at home doing this, um, staring at a screen, but we've used that time to kind of really question where we're at. And I, and, I, and I suppose for me, COVID, the one good thing about it has been that space and that time to think, um, and that space and that time to think that when we come out of this, do we have an opportunity now to, re, to do things differently because it doesn't have to go back um, to how it was. Yeah, I mean, I sound like a broken record, but I keep going on about how everything doesn't, everything is how it is because of loads of contingent factors, right? Um, and, and what you were saying, is, as well as what uh, Jessica and Lily were saying, is, is so kind of like historically true. And it's this massive contradiction in a system of global capitalism, where the people who we think have the least power, because they're the most exploited, in virtue of the whole system relying on that exploitation, if they withdraw their labor, the whole system collapses. And there's this book by Du Bois, Black Reconstruction, um, which is one of my favorite books. And he points that out in the context of the US South during the Civil War. The US Civil War wasn't won by the North being morally superior. It was won, won by the enslaved in the US South refusing to work. And it meant that those in the South started to starve. And actually the US started to lose all of its money from exports because all of their exports came from the labor of the enslaved. Um, so that's the classic example of how you have a, literally a dehumanized group, a group that was said to be closer to animals than to humans, um, who were so exploited that they weren't even receiving a wage for their labor. Um, so it seems like they're completely, you know, nobodies, literally. They had the most power in the whole of that world system at that particular moment, as they showed, right? And you see the same in Haiti with the Haitian Revolution, where um, the slave revolt involved burning down the plantations, refusing to work, and so on. And that meant that France had to abolish slavery. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to continue being a revolutionary state at that particular time. Um, so, so I think that that point is just so important that even the way we think about exploitation and who's dehumanized and so on, in our system, it always bears a contradiction because it means that we rely so much on the exploitation that we simultaneously give them so much power to um, be able to change that system itself. The, but, but it comes back to what Nidu was saying, it, to the extent of... Um, it requires a lot, right? It requires a lot of spirit to, to, to withdraw your labor because there's a threat of death if you do so. Like what you saw in the, in the revolutions and in the US Civil War, the, there's a threat of more than just being fired by your employer. So, um, so it's a difficult situation of life and death. Yeah, it's, um, and, and I suppose um, evolutionary, theory would say that you know our, our survival instinct is such that we would rather survive than refuse if that's the choice that you make but survival survival on what terms and for whom and for what mm, um i was just going to bring in another uh, like a contemporary example of what ali was just describing um there is a 
um, author called Harsha Walia, um, and the book's called Undoing Border Imp Imperialism. And in that um, book, they talk about how um, it's illegal immigrants which actually uphold the system because by making um, migrants illegal, you're then able to exploit them further, not give access to the welfare state, less than minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera, which is something which um, is so true for the EU in particular. Like that's just a context that I know um, I'm more familiar with, but so that that really brings that point what Ali says um, to the to the contemporaries because yeah, without that illegal immigrant, which we seem to see as the most dehumanized, the most without rights, um, that they're actually keeping the system afloat. Yeah. Um, someone's asked a question for, for me to talk more about the Delhi farmers. I'm not an expert on this by any means. I've just read the news, which is um, that the farmers uh, for the last two months have occupied the streets of Delhi, um, partly because the government is introducing new legislation that would, uh, would to some extent, um, remove the, their capacity to earn money from their small holdings um, in favor of larger industrialized farming practices. Um, and the, 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 the protests have, uh, turned, have been politicized on identity because a large number of the farmers protesting in, in Delhi are from the state of Punjab and they are Sikhs. And uh, they have now been branded as part of some sort of separatist movement for a, a sort of Sikh separatist state of Khalistan, which is completely fictitious. It's people, for the most part, standing up for their own rights to make their own livelihoods. Um, but uh, it seems like um, it's very easy to, I suppose, find points of difference and to then diminish people's legitimate um, complaints or their, their, their concerns by uh, subsuming their concerns into a, a sort of politicized agenda based on that difference, which is which is what's happening. And, you know, the the arrest of activists um, who are sharing digital toolkits, it's just um, it kind of beggars belief, really, that um, that the state of democracy is so fragile that they think three people sharing a digital toolkit is going to bring down the state. That's what I know about it. Um, but I don't also I don't feel like an expert to comment on it. So I uh, but it was a question that was asked, so I'm going to just leave it there. <laughs> There's this great sociologist called Sujata Patel who, who writes a lot about India, and she has this theory of um, what she calls colonial modernity. And it's basically the process through which um, during its colonial occupation, Britain basically had this idea that India doesn't really have any records of its past that so will give it its own records. And they created this myth that India was invaded by these superior Aryans, who had this amazing language and this amazing culture. Um, and she calls, Patel calls it colonial modernity because India then came to view itself through that orientalized image of its amazing past. Um, and that's basically the basis of this Hindutva ideology, right? This, this stream of Hindu nationalism. And what's super interesting to link that, which was happening in you know, the 20th century to what's happening now with the farmers is that the key kind of, um, theorists of this Hindu nationalism, which was supposed to be anti-colonial, but ended up reinscribing the same relations of inequality. Um, they were in um, cahoots with Mussolini's Italy or and Hitler's um, Nazi party, where that, for example, the Nazi's treatment of the Jews was seen to be a model for what we should do with, with Muslims in India, and as you were saying, Sikhs in India. Um, and they saw Mussolini and, and uh, Hitler as having loads of valuable economic insights because he, they were both said to be providing really strong muscular, because there's also a masculinity here, a really strong muscular control of the state and the economy. So people like ben Benoit Kumar Sarkar and so on were saying, what we need is loads of um, state control, but also loads and loads of privatization and investment and so on. Um, and there was a connection therefore between really tight regulation of the economy and this really vehement, uh, really strong statement of Hindu nationalism. And that's now what you see with Modi with, um, on the one hand, really, really strong nationalism, which you can also see in the occupation of Kashmir and so on, but also really rapid neoliberalization, which is different to some of the other populisms that are going on. 
And it's quite interesting to think about how people like Sujata Patel can really provide us with the tools to link 20th century Hindu nationalism with what's happening now, both in terms of um, ethno-religious populism, but also in terms of the economic policies they're advocating. And I think that's what you're saying with the, with the farmers in Delhi and so on. Way more insightful. That question should have been always directed at you. <laughs> Um, I'm really conscious of the time um, and that we are rapidly approaching four o'clock. So um, I wonder if, uh, if there are no other questions from the audience, whether Neelu, Jess or Ali have any final things they wanna say about the conversation we've had today. Um, or without putting you on the spot. <laughs> too much I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up and say thank you so much this has been such a pleasure for me uh to be a part of and to to sort of just the wealth of ideas and and things that we've talked about and the examples and um everything that you've brought to it it feels like there's such a kind of this is such an important area to talk about and yet the the thing overwhelmingly for me is that we're also quite tired of talking about it um so it, th there's that sort of double-edged sword that you don't get any with, and you don't get any further with it with with this, um, without talking about it, without sort of shifting the lens of the dialogue um, into something that is less rooted in um, vitriolic uh, uh, narratives, nationalist narratives, um, into something that's much more about bringing people together rooted less on individual identity and more on what our collective aspirations are. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of things to be hopeful for uh, in the future. Um, we just have to get there. I've learned a lot, thank you guys. Um, and yeah, um, in terms of like a closing statement or whatever, I just say like, it's great, actually great to talk about all of this stuff. And what I've really enjoyed about today's conversation is that we've all like been very much of the mindset of separating the emotional aspects of like how it feels to be treated as a, as a colonial subject versus like the power structures that are at play. Cause it's very difficult for everyone because we've all got personal experiences with all of this stuff that makes us feel a certain way and I think like that if, if I was going to say it's like everyone to take away one thing it would be that it's like you don't have to like turn off the frustration that comes with being personally impacted by this stuff but like if you can also have another like if you can like work enough on like your emotions to like come away from that and look at it from a more overarching perspective like it feels better because you don't you can see that you've been victimized but you don't have to feel like a victim like a personal victim like it's it's a fine distinction it's difficult to make and I'm not that good at making it but that's what I just want to say on that note I think I'm just going to say thank you everyone for for joining us today um and this was the last in our series of conversations they'll be uh we'll be sharing them online once we've uh with a full sort of packet of resources and all the references that have been brought up uh in each of the conversations um, and with transcripts, um, for those of you who've been reading the CC, uh, the closed, the, the live transcript, you'll notice that it's not exactly accurate. So we'll be editing that before we share it. Um, thank you all very much. Um, thanks everyone. I just wanted to say, if you've got any thoughts you wanna post on Twitter, our handle is fact underscore Liverpool and it's hashtag FFR2021. Um, and I know that the survey has been posted in the chat, but you can also find that on our website if you want to give us some feedback about the event.